Professor Dennett. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all coming to this uh, interesting occasion. Um, I've already been informed now. I've learned something important about Dutch education that I didn't know, that ha what a large percentage of students go to a, a religious-affiliated primary school. That's not the case in the United States. Um, I put forward my proposals with regard to public education uh, in very much in the American context. Uh, of all my books, my book on religion, Breaking the Spell, was, is the only one that was written primarily for an American audience. And I said at the outset of the book, uh, this is a book written for the American audience. People in other countries should bear that in mind if they read it and see what it tells them about what I think is going on in America, what I think is necessary to say, which might not be necessary to say where you are. And uh, I reiterate that uh, advisory here. Uh, I have not particularly sought to educate myself about the situation all around the world and what I think the right, pro uh, what the right proposals are for the rest of the world. I'm going to talk about why I proposed in the United States that there actually be compulsory education about the world's religions in all schooling, all primary schooling, whether you are in a public school or a private school or whether there's homeschooling. Homeschooling, you may know, in the United States, this is where parents take their children out of the regular schools and teach them at home. Homeschooling has been growing uh, at a great rate in some parts of the country. Some people are very alarmed about this and worried about it, and I think in some regards they are right to be worried about it. Um, but as long as it's there, and as long as it is in good favor, then I think it behooves us to think very seriously about what the state can oblige homeschoolers to do. In some regards, this is obvious. It is not controversial that it is not permissible to refuse to teach your children to read and write. It is not permissible to keep them ignorant of arithmetic, of geography, of basic facts about the world. But that's about the end of where the obligation lies. Actually, there's one more uh, requirement which might amuse you. There's a, a requirement that you teach them American history. Uh, this is done well or ill, mainly ill. Uh, but there is some teeth in this, that is to say, uh, the, st the state has the right or should I say states individually have the right to test homeschooled students and students at religious schools to see that their education is meeting minimal standards. And it is with that background that I proposed that one more requirement be added. I would like to add Information about global warming should be taught to everybody. Information about the corrupting effect of money in politics should be taught. But with limited time and energy, I think the most important thing to be added to the curriculum in American schools are facts about the world's religions uncontrovertible empirical facts about the history of the religions, about their tenets, their creeds, their rituals, their requirements, their prohibitions, their art, their architecture, their music, how many there are, where they are, the different varieties. 
basically human geography of religion. Nowhere have I said that students should be taught to believe the tenets of any religion or to be, have inculcated in them any particular faith. In fact, I view that as actually prohibited by American law, and rightly so. Separation of church and state says you shall not foster religion. You shall not teach religion in that sense. Uh, the state will have nothing to do with that. But that's different from teaching about religion. Anybody may require, or the states may require, that religion be taught about. And that's what has concerned me. And for a very straightforward reason. Today's religions around the world are all descended culturally, genealogically, from earlier religions. The religions that thrive today are, if you like, the offspring of earlier religions. The religions that thrive today benefit from their lineage by having many features that have stood the test of time, that have proven effective in maintaining allegiance and loyalty and increasing the numbers of those adherents. Sounds like evolution, doesn't it? And it is, it's cultural evolution. This evolution has occurred in an environment of, shall we say, cloudy water. There is a thesis about the great Cambrian explosion of life 530 million years ago to the effect that it was the clearing of the ocean. It was the transparency, the sudden transparency of the ocean that triggered the Cambrian explosion because for the first time eyesight worked. And as soon as creatures developed eyes, then there were so many things to see and so many things to do. Pre predation and hiding from predators took on a whole new uh, life. There were arms races of hide and seek, if you like, of camouflage and speed and stealth. That is not a proven theory, it's an interesting hypothesis. But I think another interesting hypothesis, very much like it, is this. Up until now, the social environment of the world has been, shall we say, pre-Cambrian. It was routinely easy, not, not automatic, but it was not difficult for religious leaders to keep their congregations in the dark about other religions and indeed about many features of their own religion. It was easy to maintain a level of ignorance about religions in general. And the religions that we have today all thrived under that assumption. Many of the features of their organization, their design in effect, are premised on the ability of religious leaders and religious institutions to keep the population of their religionists semi-informed or even sometimes misinformed about their religions. That day is over. Thanks to modern technology, the air is now transparent. With the internet, with cell phones, with, with television, with transistor radios, it is becoming increasingly clear that only the most stringent despotism, the most terrible imprisonment can keep people from getting the facts they want or are curious about on just about every topic under the sun. This is a whole new selective environment in which religion must now thrive or go extinct. In America, it is commonly thought that we are seeing something of a religious revival that 
tremendous enthusiasm for religion is seen on all sides. There's a tremendous hue and cry from various uh, enthusiasts for religion. I think that is a huge misperception. In fact, what we're seeing and hearing, and it's very noisy, is not a burst of new power. It is a desperate attempt to salvage religion in the new conditions of transparency. Every religion is frantic, desperate, to hang on to the population that it now covers in the face of ever more information and misinformation out there which they can no longer control. I think in general this is a good thing, or it can be. I would go so far as to venture that any religion that can thrive in a world of deep and detailed mutual knowledge of the facts deserves to thrive. May they thrive in that informed state. And that religions that cannot thrive under those conditions, that cannot succeed without pulling the hood of ignorance over the people or misinforming them, deserves to go extinct. Now, you might think then that I should just notice the trend, relax, and say, let nature take its course. Uh, nature is on my side now, on our side, and religions will either go extinct, the ones that go extinct will deserve to go extinct, the ones that will thrive will deserve to thrive. But I'm not sure that the passage, the evolutionary passage to that future is unproblematic, trouble-free. I think this is an ideal time for us to take gentle, firm, foresighted steps to foster the evolution of more benign forms of religion by making sure that a certain amount of information as opposed to misinformation is commonly out there for all children. As we all know, the internet is a vast and wonderful resource of information. It is also a medium in which there is a, an arms race of propaganda and disinformation going, going on. And I don't think we should simply sit back and let that work itself out however it does. I think it is important that we try politically, this is a political act, to compile a basic profile of every religion, major and minor, and of every group which doesn't consider itself religious, to create, in effect, uh, an almanac of, of types a catalog raisonné of religions, and that we figure out a way to introduce this as common knowledge, common mutual knowledge. You know it, I know it, I know you know it, you know I know it. This is all important. It's important that this be recognized as common knowledge. Recognize common knowledge is an extraordinarily powerful social force. And I think we should take steps to encourage the development of this common knowledge so that children everywhere growing up are introduced to it. Now, why do I think, what do I think the immediate effects of that would be? A lot of people say, well, if you oblige homeschoolers to, give, to teach this information, they will not do a good job of teaching it. I know. I'm sure that's true. 
they will not only not do a good job, they will do a terrible job. They may well say to their children, this is a pack of lies that I am obliged by the state to impose upon you. Let them do it and reap the results. At least they have to tell them. They, at least they will tell their children. And if you don't learn them well enough to recite them back when the state comes around and tests you, we will not be able to homeschool you anymore. Once this information is obligatory, every religious group in America will have to adjust its educational practices. They will have to tailor their education, their faith training, putting it in a more uh, negative light, their indoctrination, will have to be tailored to the fact that their children now know whether they believe or not. They know a bunch of claims which have to be dealt with one way or another. And they, the elders will risk the frank incredulity among their young if they do not find a good way of handling this. I am prepared to rest on that dynamic and let it take its course. I think it will, of itself, achieve powerful forces of adjustment, will eliminate currently, uh, currently uh, not just unfortunate, but, but evil strains of prejudice and vile superstition and xenophobic distrust. And this will all help the world to a more peaceful unification of different religious groups. Does it mean that different religious groups, in order to survive in this new landscape, will have to be more ecumenical, more cooperative, less fanatical, less? I think so, yes. And I'm prepared to defend that and say that's as it should be. My, hmm? we could we could yeah, very well say. Like. I just say one more thing. My dear friend Richard Dawkins and I, uh, I sometimes like to tease him because he, of course, wants to see religion extinguished. And I say, Richard, I think you ought to consider religion from a more evolutionary point of view. You don't want to extinguish religion. That's too hard. It's impossible. What you want to do is to encourage it to evolve into more benign, pacific forms. Dinosaurs aren't extinct. They are in every tree. If we could turn today's religions into bird-like forms, the world would be a better place. Thank you. Thank you.